Hi, good morning, everyone. Happy Monday morning and welcome to Women's Health Matters podcast. And on this podcast, we, we deal with all things to do with women, whether it's women in business, women with fashion, women with hormonal issues, women trying to get pregnant, women in pregnancy. So everything that covers women. So today I'm joined by an amazing guest and she is a divorce coach. So I'm going to let you let her introduce herself. But before I always forget to do this, so before I forget to say it, please, please, please subscribe to this channel because the more subscribers we have and is great and we can get some more amazing guest speakers lined up for you and with loads of information and really helpful tips so that we have great lives and full of energy and feeling like ourselves again. So I'm gonna hand over to this amazing lady and I'm gonna let her introduce herself. So hi and welcome to this podcast. Hi, good morning, Lucy. I like the way you're chickening out of my surname. <laughs> so, you <noticed> that. <laughs> yeah. So, so my my name is Claire Ockmuty, which is a bit of a mouthful, but there you go. Um, so I am originally from Galway, which is your neck of the woods. It is. And uh, my dad and my sister still live in that area. I currently live in Coleraine, up in the north of Ireland, about ten miles from the Giants Causeway. So it's great being back near beaches. I love I love being by a beach. Um, I have been in the north about 26 years now. So um, I started out life as a nurse and worked and trained in Dublin. So trained as a children's nurse in Crumlin and an adult nurse in the Meath and worked for six years in the children's hospital, which I just loved, absolutely loved. And then I met a man, as you do, who lived somewhere different. So uh, we got engaged and I moved to the north. So he happens to be a church minister. So I became a minister of life and a nurse and we moved around quite a bit. So it was interesting because when I moved to the north, um, people in the north when I moved here tend to sort of get a job and stay in a job. So a lot of the nurses I worked with were in, in my first hospital, which was the Ulster. They were kind of there until they retired. Whereas down south, people moved because you needed to go to Dublin or you know one of the cities or something. And um, with my ex-husband's job, we moved. So I was a bit of an oddity. Everybody tried to put me in boxes that I just very successfully managed to break out of all the time. So over time, we um, did IVF, had lots of miscarriages and moved houses and I changed jobs and I started work in emergency departments. So I became part of the nurse management team of a &E departments and I spent 16 years at management level doing that, which was really challenging, really interesting and uh, used to watch casualty. Yeah, I know. But I used to watch Cassidy and go, they've got that wrong. And my ex husband would go, is that accurate? It's like, no, no, they need someone like me on the script writing team. Uh, so it was interesting. Um, so, yeah, so life was anything but boring, anything but dull. And then eventually the IVF uh, wasn't successful. We did three goes and we had three uh, miscarriages. And um, we That's ended up going. Oh, it's itself. quite a journey. Like it wow. is like climbing Mount Everest each time. So on the first go, we got pregnant and I miscarried at 10 and a half weeks. And that was like, that was a fall bigger than from the moon to the earth because you'd already done the climb to get to that point. Um, so after the third failed miscarriage with, an IV, uh, with the IVF, I thought, right, well, this isn't going to work. We're not doing this. So I, um, over the space of a weekend, two different people from two completely different social circles mentioned this GP in Galway who I had actually contacted a few years before that. And he um, is Dr. Phil Boyle, and he does a, a therapy called Napro Technology. And I thought, well, it's not a coincidence, two people, two different spheres, spheres of my world in one weekend. So we made an appointment and went down and we sat in his waiting room and there were all these billboards of these babies. And I sat there and I said to my ex-husband, we're gonna have a photo of our child on that wall. So we have two photos on that wall of our two boys. So I was 40 lovely. when I had my first. I was literally the definition, apparently, of a geriatric mother. Um, to the point where when I went into hospital, the, um, the nurse in the, went into the lady in the bed beside me and read out her date of birth. And da -da. She came in to me and I said, can I just verify that by reading it? I thought, I am old enough to be the mother of these other mothers in the room. So, so my youngest was 11 this month and my eldest would be 13 next month. And um, about six years ago, I stepped away from our marriage, which just communication had broken down and it just wasn't working for me. And what I know to be true now is if a, a marriage and a partnership isn't working for one person, then it's not actually working, regardless of how much the other person thinks that it is. 
So I stepped away. I had just got a new job. So I was stepping out of my work world into practice nursing, which I had never done. And um, I'm now fully trained up as a respiratory specialist nurse. And I stepped away from the role of a minister's wife and left three quarters of my world and stepped out. So it was a very, um, it's not a time I'd like to go back to. And the kids were four and six at the time. So then um, menopause kicked in and I had lots of uh, night sweats. And so hormone patches, I, I swear by them. So that was, that's my sort of, you know, when you have lots of things separated out and go, what's the thing you can do something about? So I couldn't do anything about the new job, couldn't do anything about the diploma I had started because I hadn't studied in 15 years and my brain cells were really doing a bit of a workout. And I um, was on a divorce pathway. So that was, so the only thing I could fix was the menopause bit. And that really made a huge difference to me on that score. Um, so over the last six and a half years, I have moved house. I have got the divorce done. My children, our children go between the two of us and we co-parent well. And the kids, you know, they're either in our, my house or his house and we live six miles apart. And um, I have now chosen to change my career path completely. So this year I'm 36 years nursing from when I started, which seems like a whole lifetime. And I am stepping out of my role as a practice nurse at the end of June to work full time in my coaching business, which is mainly supporting people through a breakup or divorce journey, because I have done it and it is not a picnic, as anybody listening to this will testify. And what I know to be true now is that a divorce journey starts long before one person leaves. It starts way before when you have a disconnect in communication and one person starts to become unhappy whatever way that outworks or however, whether it's like me when I did the leaving because I, I made my choices or whether it's that you suddenly find out your partner has had an affair and you just find out and they walk out the door. Either which way, it didn't start at that moment. It started long before that. So one of the areas that I'm really passionate about is helping people, men or women, if you're in an area where things aren't working in your marriage and you don't know what's wrong, but you just know that life is not okay. Like you don't feel either connected to yourself or you don't feel like your world is good, but you don't know why or what. This is the area that I love to work with someone and go, well, let's look at it. Let's see who you are. What are your values? Do you understand boundaries? What do you want? Because so often we don't know what we want. I had no idea what I wanted. I remember when I when I started to think about values, I was reading a book and it said, um, what are your values? And I, I actually Googled a list of values. I thought, I don't know what values are. So that's where I have come from. And I have just finished my second training course recently for breakup and divorce coaching. And I have quite a few clients. And I sort of have a foot in both camps, a foot in 20 hours a week practice nursing and a foot in coaching. And I thought, I can't do either of these well. And how do I want to go forward? And I thought, I want to help people that were like me six years ago or on that journey when you get overwhelmed like a tsunami of, how do we help the children? How do I manage finances? How do I tell my parents? And being a minister's wife or an ex-minister's wife, in Ireland especially, there's this layer of guilt and shame that goes with faith in church, in divorce journeys that we don't talk about. We brush it under a table and we just say, let's just leave it there. But actually, no, no, that's not okay. It's certainly not okay with me because we do not need to go forward with guilt and shame because we're on a divorce journey. We need to take our power back and learn what it is to own our stories and tell them as they are. Because me owning my story, changing how I see my world, that I've been able to park the guilt and the shame that's gone with the fact that this didn't work and I couldn't fix it and all of those things. This has changed the legacy of my children's future forever. So what I am doing is changing my legacy. And the idea that my grandchildren in the future will have a different future because of choices I've made. That's the most amazing feeling. It's not why I left, but it is part of the outworking of the decisions that I have made. And that's why I'm so passionate about this because when I work with the client at whatever stage they happen to be, it's not just that client that I'm working with, it's their legacy. Because if I can help my client to understand their story and own it and dare to believe that it matters, then that impacts how they show up with the people in their world which is their children or their future partner or their friends or their family. 
And to do that, we need to step outside other people's stories. So in Ireland, other people's stories for divorce contain shame and guilt, shame and guilt. And, you know, well, I, I don't want a, a daughter who's divorced. And how do we step outside that mother's story? So we want to please our parents and we want to stay connected. But that is, that's the story of maybe your mum. And maybe it needs to be allowed to be her story and you don't have to take it into yours. And helping someone to separate out what is your story to own and to hold on to and to live and to write and to change. So does that give you an encapsulated essence of who I am? <laughs> I have some questions to ask you now. <laughs> How did you, because like leaving a relationship, especially when you've been married for a very long time, 26 years were you married? Is that what you no, said? We were, married, we were married 19. 19 we, were to, we were together for longer, but we were married 19. So you're with this man for a very long time, mm -hmm. married for 19 years. It takes, I, I know this because I'm separate, you know, separated as well with my older kids it takes an awful lot of courage to actually make that decision to leave and as you said especially like we lived in a small area none of my friends were separating from their husbands they some of them have you know subsequently have mm. done but I would have been the first one of that group to do it um and I um and it was for me it was like jumping off a cliff and really not knowing where I was going to land. I knew it was a very good decision for me. And I knew that when I left, but it was, yeah, the, as yeah. you said, it was the buildup. It didn't happen overnight. It was two to three years of a buildup to this point. How did you get the courage to do that? I don't know where mine came from. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't well, know. Well, I, I love the, the phrase, a slow fade. Okay. Think a marriage fades slowly and it loses its color and it loses its definition. And it loses its, its everything that it ever once was. So it's like a slow fade over time, whether it happens to both of you at the same time or to one person. And suddenly you begin to notice that, that the world is not as colourful. And, and a term that I used at one point to describe to a counsellor was, I said, I don't know how to describe my world, but I just feel it's grey. So I knew that there was a problem, but I didn't know what it was and I didn't know what to do about it. So this had been going on for quite a while. Um, so I went to a counsellor about three years before I left uh, my marriage and I went because my world wasn't okay but I had no idea why and I didn't go to fix our marriage I went to try and, and see what I could do to help me to change my world and so what I know to be true now is when we take responsibility for our world and how how we perceive it that creates change just by the fact that we're looking at us so when you say about courage, I, I mean, I, 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 we had a conversation about a year and a half before I left in which I sort of said, look, this isn't working for me. And if things don't change, then, then I'm going to not stay. So we had a backdrop of this. And at that time, my ex-husband was off work. And so pressures were different and things did change. You know, I, I felt it. And the thing is, change is what you feel. You feel if whether there's been a shift or something. So somebody saying I'm sorry doesn't mean anything, but somebody doing something that makes you feel, oh, they mean it. That there's, there's two dynamics to all of that. So there was a change, but then slowly over time, things faded again. And so in the middle of it, there was how I responded to our communication style. Everybody has a conflict resolution style. So we were in patterns. I didn't know how to break out of them or change them. And like everything, I think there was a buildup. So that was sort of the, going to the counselor was the start. Then there was the conversation that we had. And then over the following year and a half, I suddenly realized things were slipping down for me again. And I think there's, there's always a straw somewhere. So I found a straw that when I could see this straw, I couldn't unsee it. And that straw was my deciding factor. It didn't cause me to leave. It wasn't the reason I left, but it was the reason I was able to make a decision of that's it, that's it, this, this, this has to change. So for me, what I had been sensing was there's a sense of possibilities for me to live a different way. And my faith is really important to me. And I had this question that kept coming into my head, which was, is this God's best for you? And I kept thinking it couldn't be, couldn't be God's best because it doesn't feel good. And when I looked at that question and I thought, well, what might God's best feel like? I thought, well, surely it would be to be happy and to be 
connected and to be moving forward and growing and changing because that's what humans that's what we do and when I got the information that I did over the time that created my straw I already had this pull forward for me and I thought I don't know what it will look like and for me I had to leave my home because as a minister we live in the house belonging to Peter's job so so that was a thing and I thought okay so now I have to create a home and, and all of those things so I don't look back at the time I didn't think it was courageous I thought this is the only option I have now that I know I can't stay and I was very clear I thought I can't stay so now I, I'm going to go I'm not going to go back and I have to figure out how to do it so all of my energy went into what do I need to do to make this happen and what will it look like and I mean I stepped off a very large cliff and you know all of the things, and I was changing my job at the same time. And I think now, when I listen to what I say about my story, I think, wow, that was courageous. But at the time, it was it was the only next step in front of me that I could see if I didn't want to stay. So it wasn't that I felt courageous or brave, it's that I didn't want to stay here. So not to stay there, I had to take a step. And then I had to take the next. So I kept taking small steps and, and figure out what did I need next. Do you look at it as courageous now? Yes, yes, I do, because fear keeps us small and fear keeps us stuck, very stuck, because we're afraid of what we don't know. And sometimes what's familiar is easier, feels easier because we're, we're used to it. Yeah, and now I know that 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 what I did was I took a chance on me. I took a chance that there was more for me. So when I did that, what I did was I said yes to me living, changing. And the outworking of saying yes to me turned out to be a no to being married. So I didn't say no to being married first. I said yes to me. And that allowed me to have the outworking effect of no to being married. Can you feel, see the difference in that? Because there is a slight difference. And that, so my drawing forward wasn't to get away, wasn't that. It was, I wanted to find out who else could I be if I lived in a different world. And the outworking of that turned out to be stepping out of my marriage. Because there are some marriages, and I truly believe this, and I believe that mine wasn't, it was, it had come to its end, that need work, you know, that they need um, help. And it's not, it's Absolutely. really good to seek help um, in your marriage because sometimes we do take each other for granted and we do say things that are really hurtful and spiteful, both parties, um, you know, and that you just, it's about reconnecting because all the things that you fell in love with in the first place, they're still there. They haven't mm -hmm. changed. They've just got lost somewhere along the way. Yes. Yeah. I think, yeah, I, uh, yeah. I, I mean, wouldn't... and that's why, that's why I'm passionate about that section of a breakup or divorce journey. You know, I don't work with couples. I choose to work with one person. If one person comes to me and says, I'm not sure if I should go or stay. My, my viewpoint, my lens to look at the world is, well, look at everything you invested to start this. You invested in the wedding, you invested in money and time and emotions and getting your family together. Surely if you're going to end it, it's worth an investment. And maybe you don't need to end it. And what might that look like if you didn't have to? But things have to change if you're going to stay because if they don't change, you're going to stay in this, will I, won't I, will I, won't I, not happy. So mm -hmm. one person taking the brave step to look at their world from their aspect. We come from different maps of the world, and this is the stuff I've learned. So one person might come from a family where everybody explodes in anger and then it's all gone, dissipates. Nobody takes any heat to it, but the energy is out there and the person can move on. If they marry somebody whose family never argued, you can see straight away how somebody exploding in anger, which is what they're used to, is going to be perceived as from the person who's never had a voice raised in their home growing up. It's threatening, it's, it's difficult, it's, fright, it's, it's all of these things, but that is not to do with anything other than you both come from different backgrounds. And maybe if you learn to understand what those backgrounds are, you can then have a better ability to cope with how you interpret things because it's there, it's the only normal somebody knows how to do. And looking at the world through how, so what I help someone to do is frame their world. How do you see the world? Because that is how you view your marriage and how you see the world. 
And what if you were able to hold that a little bit looser? What if you were able to become curious about it? And what if your partner wanted to become on this journey with you because in the middle of you're both not happy? Maybe you both want to find each other, but you don't know how. So there's different ways. One would be relationship counseling. One would be going to counseling for one person. And one would be for one person to go to a coach to find out. So coaching for me is where are you now? Where would you ideally like to go? Do you want to leave or do you actually want to stay? Find out what you want and then put the investment into whatever that answer is and, I think, and move forward. I, I really, I really, really agree on that because I think that having done counselling myself as a couple, it's very, it's very, um, what is the word I'm looking for? It can be very traumatic because mm -hmm. it becomes a bit of a, you said this, you did this, you did this, yeah. you did, and it becomes quite, and there's no, you're back in that, as you said, that cycle again. But I think if you work on yourself yes. to get in a better place, then that actually radiates out into a relationship. And then the hope, you would hope if you want your marriage to work or your relationship to work, that your partner picks up on this and then he starts or she starts reflecting that back to you. Yeah, and that's the thing because it's the unknown. You know, if you're willing to put the work into you, the unknown is how will your partner respond? Yeah. But the reality is if you leave that marriage, you're still taking you with you. Yes. And if you don't look at you, you're going to end up with the same patterns in a different relationship because you're still you. So when I left my marriage, I thought, I want to figure this out. Who was I when I met him? Who was he when he met me? How did we fit? What happened? And how did I not have that again? Because it nearly killed me one time. I thought, I'd, I mean, the statistics for second marriage going into divorce are very high. They're about 70%, very high. Because if we don't look at who we are, well, we're just taking us into the next thing. So I really know that, I mean, I've worked with clients and they have stayed and they've stayed really well. And that is a joy for me because a divorce or breakup journey is not easy. It's so challenging on many levels. And if you don't need to do it, what might that look like? So when you work on you, you get to change. The unknown is what will your partner do? But is it worth taking a chance? I reckon it is. You know, I look back and I think if I had known all the stuff that I know now back then, would we have had a different outcome? Could we have? I, I don't know. But I just know that I wish I had a lot of that because I didn't have any of this then. Yeah, it's very true, isn't it? That Yeah, you can have a possibly different outcome, but maybe maybe it would have been a different outcome. Maybe you would have uh, um, ended your relationship sooner. That's a you, that's an if and, you know, don't know. Yeah. And the one thing I know for definite is I might have ended it differently because if you choose, if you work with someone like me as a coach and you choose to know that actually this marriage is not working for me and I need to, I need to step out of it, there are different ways to step out. You can step out by blowing up a volcano in your sitting room, per se, or you can step out knowing what it is that you want, knowing how to communicate, knowing how to give yourself the best chance of being heard by your partner. And you can change the fallout of a divorce journey by looking at what it is you want to allow. So the question I would ask is, when you go to one year down the line, do you want to look back and be proud of how you navigated this? And if you do, let's work on that. And that's where looking at values, you know, if loyalty and kindness are part of your values, then being kind is important. And what does being kind look on a divorce journey? Mm. so it's those kind of things but so you can change the story of divorce if that's where you end up and it's not that it's it's um I look at things like that and I think some things come to a natural end but you can create a, a better ending if you choose to do that it doesn't have to be an explosion it doesn't the children don't have to be damaged for life that's not the way it has to be and I that's that, where I come from that's a fear isn't it that uh yeah when you've got small children my kids were quite small when I separated uh Hannah was eight and James was three nearly four mm -hmm. uh, you know they're quite young ages now um she was more uh, affected than he was he was a bit littler to be affected but um he still was affected down the road but uh, in the beginning yeah no it was tough and I wish I knew, knew this stuff then um because I'm separated gosh mm, 
18 years, maybe more. Um, but, you know, and, and our kids are fine. They've done well. But it was in the beginning, in that first year, it was hard. We were nasty to each other. There's, you know, yeah. I have to hold my hand up, but, you know, we were nasty. And it was very difficult not dragging your children into that. Very difficult. So we had to step back. I had to step back from that because, as you said, that wasn't my values. I'm not. That isn't what I am. Yeah. That's not who I am. And I didn't but, like it. I didn't like um, myself for being like that. And, you know, that's that's really I, I remember reading a phrase thinking I wish I had read this phrase a long time ago. And the phrase was, I don't like the me that I am when I'm with you. If I had read that phrase, I would have made faster decisions because actually I didn't really like the me that I was. I was busy, I was tired, I was stressed, I was trying to do too much. I wasn't really living. And that, you know, that I think that phrase is a good lens to put into your world. So if you're listening to this, you know, put that, put try those glasses on for size. Do you like the me that you are when you're in this marriage? And if the answer is no, not really, well, what are you going to do about that? So you can observe it, notice it, and do nothing. Or you can observe it, notice it, become aware and become curious and go, why is that? What can I do about that? You're going back to the shame of being a separated woman with kids. It's yeah. a terrible, you know, it, it is that. And really, um, there isn't a shame to it. There's a, no. a courage and braveness to it that you brought your kids out of that situation and yourself um whereby they still you're still co-parenting that you, you haven't taken away their dad or their mom no. and you are actually teaching them that it's healthy to move away from something that's not healthy yeah well what I know is that my children have the best version of me yeah and that's what they wouldn't have had because that's not who I was then at that point for all sorts of reasons um, and, you know, our children learn because of how we teach them and they watch us. So they watch how I talk about things. They watch how I respond emotionally. So I can teach my children lots. I, I do remember, and especially because of the IVF thing for us, you know, I remember one time in the apartment that I lived in an apartment for a year and a, nearly a year and a half after I left. And I remember one day you know that feeling of that brick wall and you cry as if your heart is going to break, you know that feeling. And for me, it was, I didn't ever, ever plan to bring children into this world and not live as a family. Like that was never my plan. And then a friend of mine rang me and I was chatting to her and she said, but you are a family. I said, no, a family of four. And she said, who said a family has to be four? And in that moment, she gave me freedom to own my new world in a way that I hadn't given myself. Me and the boys were a family in my home and the boys and their dad were a family in his home. And this family was healthy and good for me and good for them. And that allowed me to own that in a way that I didn't know how to without having got to the real depth of why I was upset, acknowledging it. And then my friend stepped in and gave me that information and I thought, oh gosh, wow. So when we're able to actually feel the feelings then we can let them pass through and they don't get stuck. Mm. I remember actually a, a, a friend of mine telling me when Hannah was little, uh, maybe she was about 11 or 12, to give her permission to be, a tw I think she could have been a bit older actually, 12 or 13, to give her permission that her job was to worry about how she was going to convince me to go to the first disco, <laughs> uh, you know, wearing short skirts, makeup. Yes. She said, let her be the girl that she needs to be at that age and not trying to mind you or her father yeah you know give her permission and I remember sitting in the car and saying to her this is what you need to worry about you need to worry about you at 13 convincing me and your dad to let you go to this disco convincing us that you're okay to go and get your fake tan you know that type of stuff yeah and I could see the relief on her little face Going. such a gift you gave her such yeah. a gift but isn't it interesting that you and I both had friends you know so what I know to be true is when we try and do life on our own it doesn't fare out very well it's certainly it's not easy and, and I I know that one of the biggest things for me on my journey was I felt disconnected but the first disconnection was with myself 
And then I felt disconnected from my friends. I didn't know how to have that connection. But we, as a, as a, as a people, as a race, as humans, we are made for connection, which is why COVID has been so extremely difficult. Because if we're made for connection and we're suddenly isolated in these bubbles, my goodness me, no wonder there is this rise in, in you know, mental health issues and anxiety and you know, marriages that aren't functioning as well as they did before, because maybe you were both doing different things and you didn't realize how, how little you had in common, but suddenly you're together all the time. Or maybe there's the added pressure of somebody's lost a job in the middle of a pandemic. And what I know so true for me is that I have needed people. I have needed friends. I have needed my counselor. I have, I have a coach because I think if I'm asking people to invest in me, well, then I want to invest in me at the other side of this to be the best version that I can be because we can speak into each other's lives far easier than we can speak into our own. Mm. I am so much more compassionate for somebody else and their story than I probably am with my own. So true, isn't it? <laughs> so how, um, so you were leaving your husband, you made that decision with two small children. Um, how, like, how did you come to an agreement where you shared your children? Because you you do become a bit like they're mine, not yours. <laughs> you become a little bit like that. Yeah, um, and that that's the difficult thing. There's two things on a divorce or breakup journey that'll cause contention and struggle for control. Generally, they're finances and children. And so it is a really, really, really big deal. Um, what we, well, I suppose because I did the leaving and I had had the time to think, I was much further along a pathway than my ex-husband was. And I, I really tried to be mindful and aware of that because there was a lot of catching up of the changes in his world that he had to do. And um, I suppose because of the nature of the publicness of his job, there was lots of different factors and dynamics in play. So I, I, made, a, a, I made a choice, be it right or wrong, I, I don't know. And in fact, I, I kind of like to take the words right and wrong out of choices and decisions to take the weight of any responsibility that we can misplace on it. Um, the children were with me mostly during the weeks and every alternate weekend with their dad to start with. But he saw them, he picked them up after school nearly every day. So access was always open but I wanted to create stability by way of bedtime and they were getting used to living in a new place and so much had changed in some ways. And then we actually went to mediation. There's um, family mediation NI up here. And we went to mediation to figure out how to have a pattern that would be acceptable to us both for the children. So having the child's best, having our boy's best interest at heart, but we both had wants and needs too. And we went to mediation and through our mediation sessions, our wonderful mediator helped us to find a pattern that we still use today. So that, that was a real gift of going to someone as a safe space for both of us to be able to have our say, to mull over ideas for me to say, I think this might work and my ex to go, well, it won't work for me because of this. But we had the ability to have communication, to be heard and seen, to get to an, a result and an agreement. And, that's what we did and it worked for us. So essentially a win-win situation for both of you. So yeah, you and now about feeling that you won, which is absolutely. important. No, it, it is a feeling that like we could manage the world that we were living in a little bit better because now we had structure and routine and we had both agreed with it. So the fight was gone. We, we, we didn't have that element of tension. And now, I mean, years down the line now, you know, if my ex-husband goes away for a week with business or work or something, the kids stay here. If I'm going away for something, the kids stay with him. We have flexibility. And we've always in, endeavored to try to have that. But now flexibility comes easier for us both. So my first port of call, if I have something on after school or there's an issue I mean, this afternoon, I can't pick up my youngest from school because I'd forgotten to have a meeting and it's the other side of Coleraine. So I, I, the first person I, I contacted was my ex to go, are you free? Can you pick him up? So, so we have that now, which is just great because everybody, including the children, benefit when there is no tension underneath the surface. But time is one of the best reasons to get to that point. So time and using, you know, if communication isn't easy, then find someone to help you. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree that mediation, that was something that we used and it is immensely helpful financially yeah. for the finances, um, you know, because 
when you have kids, they they cost money. Um, yeah, and, and you're living in two two households now being run, not just one. Yeah, yeah it, there's a lot there. So yeah, mediation is great advice. Absolutely great advice. Um, I have another question for you. Mm -hmm. Like because of his role in the community and your role in the community as a minister's wife, that was tough leaving. I'm sure there was you left a lot of wagging tongues. Quite sure. Mm. Um, How did you um, deal with that? Um, well, I made a decision before I left to not contact anybody in the parish unless they contacted me because I didn't want to put somebody in a position that they would choose not to be in because they didn't quite know how to handle it. So I made that decision before I left. And I had no idea. I mean, I had no idea how anybody would perceive this. It's a, I mean, it's a really big thing. It's, it's really big. And it rocked a lot of people's worlds. And I know that. And I suppose the reality of you never know what goes on behind somebody's front door. I mean, there were lots of rumors and lots of things. I chose to be as okay as I could saying nothing. I thought this is nobody's business. And no matter what I give out by way of talking to someone, the people who the people who wanted to know my story didn't have a compassion for me. Some of it was they just wanted the story and the story would never be dramatic enough. So it was always going to get added to. Hmm. So you can tell the difference. So I just let that be. I thought the people that know me can figure out fairly fast what's true and what's not. People that know me will know what I, what I am capable of and not capable of. So I let my character stand in front of me and not justify it. Now, there were times, you know, when schoolgate all sorts of different things but I thought I have done nothing wrong and I suppose the, the 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 really crucial bit that I got to understand before I left was that I didn't break my marriage I left a marriage that was broken and that's a very different statement so when I owned that before I left the marriage it allowed me to not feel guilty for breaking something I left something that was broken but I didn't actually break it. So blame for me wasn't at my door. This was the outworking of my decision based on the information I had at the time. And how we talk to ourselves, oh my goodness, we would never talk to anyone else the way we talk to ourselves. It's my so inner critic was on steroids. Okay. What are they thinking? Are they talking about me? Yeah, I mean, all of this stuff. But I couldn't do anything about that. And one of the things, the really important things I, I help my clients to understand is, when you focus on what you can't control, you spiral downwards. I have no control over what anybody else thinks or says about me, but I can control what I think and say about myself. And that helps my clients to shift their focus back onto them and lose this trying to be someone that they think they might have to be for somebody else to accept them. If we have to be somebody else for someone to accept us, then I would ask, is that person good for you? Are they healthy for you? Do you need them in your world? We shouldn't have to change, not for somebody. We shouldn't have to fit into anybody's box. So how you perceive it and where you focus on is what I can help my clients to do. And I do that because I've, I've, I, I have literally walked this journey. <laughs> so between hindsight, insight, all of that, that's kind of how I have seen it. And, and the reality is the world didn't end. Nobody fell off a cliff. The drama was soon replaced with something else. It's, it's very, good. yeah, no, that's true. Um, and again, I remember when I first decided I was going to leave my ex, I got courage actually by another lady who had done it and she had survived I think for mm -hmm. me that was it that she was still standing still living still smiling still making a living still able to manage her life and yeah. that's what gave me courage actually to do it um I you know I really really appreciate that lady for showing me that courage actually that made me go yeah I can actually do this so I think it's a big decision. Um, it was a good one for me. I don't regret it. And my kids are absolutely flying. You know, they've both finished Brilliant. school, went to uni, you know, doing careers that they want to do. So, yeah, super. It was, you know, so I didn't fail them. No, but even if you had regrets, that doesn't mean you fail your children. 
you know, you being their mum, children need security and stability. Yes. That's what they need to make them fly in the world. Yes. You know, we only make the best decisions we can with the information we have in our life at any given moment in time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what I want my clients to do is to understand how to make a good decision. Because if you can make a good decision based on understanding who you are and the circumstances and what your values are and why it's important, then you won't regret it regardless of what the decision is. The decision doesn't matter. It's if you're going to live in regret for the next 10 years, that's what impacts you and your children much more. Yeah, yeah, it is that decision. It's whether you're going to stay like this, as you said, at yeah. 40 and going to be like it at 50 or it doesn't matter the age. I'm just using that as an age bracket. Yeah, yeah it's true. And it won't change unless, yeah. It, it and and you know, listening to you talk about, you know, having seen somebody else do it and she inspired you and gave you courage. That's why I'm doing this. I want people to see what's possible. So mm. this is possible in my world. I mean, as the single mom with a mortgage, I'm stepping out of my job with a paid pension and salary to do this full time because I know that if I can be here, anybody can be here. This is what's possible in my world. And this is what's possible for other people when they start to look outside the world that they've seen as really small with fear. What might be possible? Maybe this could be good. What might that feel like? All of those things. And I really hope and pray that me being who I am and where I am now is inspiration in its own right with nothing that I ever say when I open my mouth because this is possible. That's what that's who I want to be for people is if she can do it, I can do it. That sense, you know? Yeah, it's very true. And what about for a new relationship? Have you thought of that? Is it something that you want to go into? Because quite a lot of women who separate and men, they don't want to be single. They want to be in a kind, loving relationship. Yeah, no, I absolutely would love to be married again in the future. I'm totally not against marriage, not against relationships. I think my priority when I look back was I wanted to figure out what happened because I wanted, you know, so many times you hear of second relationships not working. And I thought, no, I want a second relationship, but I want to know it has the best chance of being as whole as possible. And for that to happen, I need to feel whole. So when we look for somebody else to give us what we can only give ourselves, that's when you start to have cracks and tension. Because I, nobody can make me happy. I get to choose to be happy all on my own. So for me, going into a relationship, I don't want a relationship to make me happy. I want it to add and increase and bring more abundance into my world. And I'm absolutely open to that. I haven't met Mr. Wright yet, but I'm absolutely open to that. But I feel now that the, the looking at who I am and how I have, how I react to things, how I think about things, how I process things has made me a better version of me, which means I will be less insecure. I won't be looking for someone to give me what I know I can give myself. So that means for me, the possibility of meeting someone is now exciting. It's not that I want to meet someone because I want my world to be whole. I want, so there's, there's no sense of scarcity or desperation. There's this sense of my world is really good. I would love somebody to enhance it. But if somebody comes in and they, and they take away from it, it's like, no, no, I respect myself too much. That's not happening. This is not staying. So I now understand how my world is and where I would like it to go. Wow, that's really powerful ending to this podcast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Honestly, you've been a real inspiration. And I hope that if anyone has listened, you know, if you've listened to this, that they get in contact with you to help with any relationship issues that they are going through because I think you're going to be an amazing coach for them a superstar coach thank for you them. really really do and thank you for your words of wisdom and courage and if anyone is thinking about a divorce or separation that yes you can you can do it if it's what you want and if it's not what you want then there's ways of fixing fixing your relationship to whatever you know whatever works for you guys okay so Claire thank you so much thank you um, for having me it's been really no fun at all. and thanks everyone for listening thank you bye